well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? Or am I able to talk to you man to man? It was an act of cowardice, and it was evil. But sitting down here now, and let me make clear, I'm not sitting here trying to influence you. Well, I was going to tell you that, but uh, we're, we're investigating the kidnapping. There's also no witnesses, really. There's no one else around. We're done. Up in low. Just remote area. Number five, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious serial slayers in American history. He was responsible for the demise of at least 30 young women during the 1970s and is believed to have committed many more slayings that were never solved. Bundy was known for his good looks and charm, which he used to lure his victims to their end as well as escape authorities like the FBI and local police. Bundy's slaying spree began in 1974 when he moved to Washington State to attend law school. He began to target young women, usually those with long, straight hair that resembled his ex-girlfriend. Bundy's crimes became more frequent and more brutal over time. He would often keep the bodies of his victims for several days before disposing of them, and he would often return to the crime scene to engage in necrophilia. Bundy was arrested for the first time in 1975 after being pulled over for a traffic violation. Police found suspicious items in his car, including a ski mask, gloves, and a crowbar. Bundy was initially released but he was later identified as a suspect in several slayings and was arrested again. Bundy was put on trial in 1979 for the slaying of two women in Florida. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, including bite marks that matched his teeth, Bundy was able to charm the jury and delay his sentencing for several years. The FBI played a critical role in Bundy's arrest. In 1978, the FBI established a task force to investigate the slayings of young women in several states, and the FBI provided resources and support to local law enforcement agencies to help solve the Bundy's case. Number 4. Timothy McVeigh On April 19, 1995, at 9.02 a.m., a 4,800-pound ammonium nitrate fuel oil explosive went off in a rider truck parked at the north entrance of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in downtown Oklahoma City, slaying 168 people and injuring approximately 850. The governor's office reported that 30 children were orphaned, 219 children lost at least one parent, 462 people were left homeless, and 7,000 people lost their workplaces. Bombing in Oklahoma City was an attack on innocent children and defenseless citizens. You'll see that maybe not everything is true that you've heard about me. For example, what's not true? This morning, the United States of America carried out the severest sentence for the gravest of crimes. Well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? Or am I able to talk to you man to man? It was an act of cowardice, and it was evil. But sitting down here now, and let me make clear, I'm not sitting here trying to influence you. And one young man met the fate he chose for himself six years ago. I'm not conning anybody. I'm just being me. The victims of the Oklahoma City bombing have been given not vengeance, but justice. Maybe one of the benefits of me talking to you today is that McVeigh is specifically charged with having delivered the bomb to the Murr building. Most people in this country think you are the face of evil, don't they? They do. In a truck that he rented under a false name and having detonated the bomb. And I'm not putting on a game face. Uh, Final punishment of the guilty cannot alone bring peace to the innocent. And I will not allow the people of this country to be intimidated. Today, every living person who was hurt by the evil done in Oklahoma City. For the survivors of the crime, or balance the scales. The United States will not tolerate it. Reckless media accusations that the perpetrators were Islamic terrorists led to two days of intensive anti-Muslim hysteria throughout the nation. The arrests of Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, however, brought the uncomfortable realization that the perpetrators were military veterans of the Gulf War who found persuasive the conspiratorial worldview of militia culture and viewed the incident as a justifiable attack against the federal government of the U.S., in which the slaying of innocents was characterized, in McVeigh's words, as collateral damage. Both these monsters taunted law enforcement agencies with their crimes, but they could not escape justice. Timothy McVeigh was found guilty on all counts on June 2, 1997, and executed on June 11, 2001. 
Terry Nichols was found guilty of conspiracy and manslaughter on December 24, 1997, and sentenced to life in prison with no parole. Number 3. Gary Ridgway Gary Leon Ridgway is famous for admitting to most serial slayings. He is linked to the cases of 48 young women. Most were slain around Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. It took nearly 20 years for Ridgway to be caught and brought to justice. He committed the majority of his slayings between 1982 and 84, during which time the bodies of many of his victims were found near Green River in Washington. This earned the then-unknown assailant the title of the Green River Slayer. Police officers discovered the bodies of many of Ridgway's victims naked along the riverbank. The Sheriff's Department founded the Green River Task Force and assigned the men involved with the responsibility of tracking down the perpetrator. In 1982, Gary Ridgway was arrested on an adult body trade charge. He was a suspect in the slayings, but after passing a polygraph test in which he claimed to be innocent, he was released from custody. Despite this, members of the task force held on to their suspicions and to samples of his hair and saliva. In 1984, the slaying seemed to have stopped, but the search continued for the slayer. By 2001, investigators had DNA evidence of the slayer and it was compared to the strands of Ridgway's hair still in police custody. The samples matched. Ridgway was arrested on November 30, 2001, after being linked to the slaying of four women. During the trial that followed in 2003, Ridgway pleaded guilty to the slayings of 48 women. He confessed to 71 slayings, but there are suspicions of as many as 90 in total. To avoid the fatal penalty, he agreed to help police officials locate the remains of his victims that had not yet been discovered. Number 2. Israel Keys Israel Keys will go down in history as one of the most elusive criminals. He was a notorious American serial slayer who took the life of at least eight people between 2001 and 2012. Keyes became known for his meticulous planning and his ability to avoid detection by law enforcement. His crimes were so heinous that some are even difficult to comprehend, especially when you get to know that he had not a drop of remorse for his actions. Keyes began his slaying spree in 2001, when he abducted and slew a young woman in Oregon. He continued to slay people over the next decade, often traveling to different states to commit his crimes. Keyes was a meticulous planner, and he would carefully scout out his victims before carrying out his attacks. Keyes' crimes were a step beyond brutal, they were disgusting. He would often torture his victims before slaying them, and even claim that he enjoyed slaying and that it was like an addiction for him. Keyes was finally caught in 2012, when he was pulled over by Texas police for a routine traffic stop. He was found to be in possession of several weapons and was arrested. Keyes initially refused to cooperate with authorities, but he eventually confessed to his crimes. Keyes' trial was highly publicized, and he taunted law enforcement and the FBI throughout the proceedings. He refused to reveal the identities of all of his victims, and he claimed that he had committed slayings in several other countries. Well, I was going to tell you that, but uh, we're, we're investigating kidnapping. There's also no witnesses, really. There's no deals around. I was smart. I would let them come to me. Why is that? Kidnapping where? I don't know where you're from. Come go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live. Okay. Uh, just get from the west, the first time. What are you doing down this way? Oh, this is a family came down for a wedding. Exactly what you're not much to choose from, in a manner of speaking, but. We're dead. Up in low. Just remote area. Where you, uh, where you headed? Uh, back up to the other people go to as well. Some of his taunts to police and the FBI were particularly chilling. He would often leave cryptic messages for law enforcement, and he claimed that he had buried caches of weapons and other items in remote locations around the country. He would challenge authorities to find these caches and would provide vague hints as to their locations. If legacy was something Keyes cared about, he surely fortified his. Keyes' legacy is one of fear and horror, and his crimes will be remembered as some of the most heinous in history. Number 1. Dennis Rader The BTK serial slayer Dennis Rader terrorized his community for over 30 years, taking the lives of 10 people while taunting police by sending detailed letters about his gruesome slayings. For years, the BTK slayer blended into his community in Wichita, Kansas, avoiding police detection related to the string of slayings that fulfilled his intimacy desires. By day, Raider was a devoted family man to his wife, Paula Dietz, and his daughter, Carrie. He was also a government employee at Wichita's ADT Security Services, a director at the Christ Lutheran Church, and a Cub Scout leader. However, Raider kept his tendencies well hidden, 
as he was widely recognized in his community as a normal, polite, and well-mannered individual. Raiders' rampage began in January 1974 with the slayings of four members of the Otero family. The victims Joseph, 38, Julie, 33, Joseph Jr., 9, and Josephine, 11, were discovered by the family's three other children, Charlie, Denny, and Carmen Otero, teenagers at the time. A month later, he sent a letter to the Wichita Eagle detailing exactly how he took the lives of the Oteros. Raider wrote the following, Those three dudes you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero slayings. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and with no one's help. There has been no talk either. Let's put this straight. Raider went on to provide graphic details that only someone at the crime scene would know. In the letter, Raider grappled with his urges, calling his bloodthirsty alter ego the monster. Between 1974 and 77, Raider slew three more women, Catherine Bright, 21, Shirley V. and Relford, 24, and Nancy Fox, 25. In early 78, he sent another letter to a local TV station claiming responsibility for the slayings of the Oteros, Bright, Relford, and Fox. After his seventh slaying, he taunted the police and FBI by writing, How many do I have to slay before I get a name in the paper or some national recognition? After his last victim in 1991, Raider took a decade-long hiatus, and by 2004, the investigation of the BTK Slayer was considered a cold case. However, his need for attention led to his downfall, as he sent 10 letters to local outlets from 04 to 05. In January 2005, Raider sent a postcard to a Wichita TV station with the location of two packages. The first was a cereal box containing details about the 1974 Otero slings and dolls representing the victims. The other, which was accidentally thrown away from the Home Depot to which it was sent, contained a floppy disk asking police if he could safely communicate with them. The police played into his scheme and ultimately used other disks Raider sent to track him down. On February 25, 2005, Raider was pulled over by several police vehicles trailing him and was taken into custody. He confessed to the slayings after being confronted with the DNA evidence. In July 2005, Raider pleaded guilty to the BTK slayings and was later sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. That's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time.